What? Do you want to grab the milk? My milk. Please. Good morning, everybody. It's time for book club. How is everybody on this morning? It's the morning of our great morning, apparently. Yes, he's home safe. It's true. What did I miss that caused that face? What face? What did I what face did I make? I don't I don't remember. It's afternoon for you in Norway. Whoa, very cool. Oh weird. What? Tastes like you got a babble? Sour. Oh. Babble. Weird, like it tastes weirdly sour. Well, every once in a while you get a bad one, right? Not like that. Really? No, good. We do. Oh, I'm sorry, Katie. Oh, man. I was making a face. Mm. That does happen. I do do that. I do do that. That just means it's bad. Yeah. Everyone said welcome back to the cool kids club to you. Cool kids club. I was kicked out of the kids club. Oh, no, he wasn't. He was talking about bad watermelon. It was like a bad piece of watermelon he tried to... Oof. To eat, and it didn't go well. Yeah. Sad yeah. Sad for everybody. Is there a good piece of watermelon? Well, I sure hope so. My hair is flopping around like a crazy pants. Let's fix it, shall we? Let's fix my hair so that it doesn't do that. Bad hair. Don't do it. Yeah, I could do the clips. Yeah. Yeah, not good. Not good at all. Whoa, French toast. Um, that feels like a lot for Wednesday. I don't know. We can do that this weekend. Oh. Oh, okay, then yeah. Yeah. That's okay. You don't like watermelon? Unsolicited butter. That is a pretty funny username. What's the funniest username that everyone has seen on TikTok? Sometimes I see really funny ones and I really like it. Like, I love Amber Sandwich. Unsocial Butter. Oh, that's me. Um, I really like Amber Sandwich. I remember the first time I saw Arbitrary Canary. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, what are some other good ones? I've seen some other really good ones. Um, actually, a little bit over afternoon. Five minutes. Wow, it is pretty late for you. I didn't realize that Norway was that much of a difference. Why did I not know that? What's Norway's time right now? Uh, between 5 and 6 p.m. Uh, well, England is eight hours long, so it's, uh, why does this say 2.51? That's weird. I don't know. Why does that say 2.51? Did I reset the clock? <laughs> I reset our the clock on our microwave when I was trying to set a timer. Oops. Oops. Yay, I'm glad you're all caught up. Hooray! Good stuff, good stuff. Time to catch up. It's 20 to 6 for you. Yeah, it's, it's pretty late. Pretty late, I must say. Yeah. Wait, what happened, Becca? Um, 
we were talking about um, those have gotten better, by the way, yeah. which is maybe how you've noticed that there are less of them. Um, oh yeah, right. Very good. Yeah. Um, did you have the rest of your cookie? I did. Ice cream cookies. It was so good. Did you have the rest of mine? No, <laughs> I would have. never do that to you. Are you kidding me? What you do I look have. like? A thief? You should have. Do I look like the type of person who uh, is a thief? Do you I'm want not. The rest of mine? Yes. You should have it. But what about you? You will be without. Well, it would make me happier. He didn't like it. I That's like what it. he's saying. No, I'll split it with you. How about that? Okay. We'll split it for dessert later. Whoa, such a good idea. No, nope, never mind. You don't already have my cookie anymore. <laughs> what? I didn't hear what you said. That food, man. Oh. I had another bite and I was like, you know what, never mind. You're not allowed to have my cookie anymore. You don't want it? No, you're not allowed to have Oh, because you do like it. Okay. We'll split it. Here, do you want to put these away? I think we should split it. Don't more question his generosity, Sasha. Yes. Everyone is saying welcome back to you, just so you know. They're happy that I'm not lonely anymore. Well, I... I have heard there had been an uptick in streams, and I thought that maybe um, you would all realize that when I'm gone, she streams more, and that getting rid of me would mean that you get more Sasha. Uh, did your conference go well? It went swimmingly. 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 They said, Becca said she noticed that there was more Sasha, but I seem to like you, so they'll let it fly. Phew. Phew. Um. Oh, look at this. Fancy. Yeah. Upgrade. Yeah. Wow. I know. I got you a sponge upgrade while you were gone. <laughs> Magical, huh? Magical. Do you want to take a sip of that? Yeah. 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 I don't like the small cups as much as I like the big cups. Yeah, we should get more big cups. So you have more options. It's okay. Usually I do the laundry more. I mean, what? the dishes more. What? And when I do the dishes more, then I can use the big cups more. Look at that glorious pour. Whoa. I was about to take the best nap during both of them. I got two, three hours. Oh, no. Oh, no. Two to three hours of sleep is not enough. Not enough. Okay, time for book club. Who's excited for some tale of magic? Wow, that's inappropriate. We're not going to read that out loud. What? I can't read it out loud. Oh, there's my big cup. I left it over here yesterday during book club. See, I got all thrown off. I don't know. The crazy thing about that is that sometimes I get flagged for being not child appropriate, but then people like that are allowed on TikTok without getting flagged. Wild. Somebody jumped in and said something crazy in the Yeah, world. inappropriate. No. Yeah. Too, too far. Okay. Um, yeah, seriously. All right. How is everyone today and are you ready for magic? Yeah! What type of magic are we talking about? Well, we don't know yet. We only read the prologue yesterday. And the prologue had zero magic? Oh, no, it had magic. She did weather magic. Weather magic? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Does she have a rain stick? No, she's a fairy. She's a fairy. Yeah, she didn't need a, a, a rain stick. Okay, so in case anyone doesn't know, if you miss a day of book club, it's okay because I upload the, the book club from that day to my YouTube, which is just Rainbow Slime Girl, and you can listen to it and catch up before the next day. I know, already me too, Naisa. I am obsessed with Madame Weatherberry already. I think she's very cool. Very cool. Madame Weatherberry. Oh, okay, Becca, that seems dramatic. <laughs> So today we're actually reading chapter one, even though we read a chapter yesterday. Hey, Grace, just in time, because yesterday was the prologue. Um, very exciting. Very, very exciting. Chapter one is called Books and Breakfast. 
honestly, that sounds like my perfect life, books and breakfast. Breakfast is my favorite meal and I like books. So this chapter was made for me. Congrats to me. Thank you, Chris Coffer. Here we go. It was no mystery why all the monks in the Southern Kingdom's capital were hard of hearing. Every morning at dawn, the city of Chariot Hills was subject to 10 minutes of uninterrupted ear piercing cathedral bells. Like the tremors of an earthquake, the clanking tones rattled toward town square and then pulsated through the city street and shook the surrounding villages. The monks purposely rang the bells in a maniac, manic and irregular manner to ensure every citizen was awake and participating in the Lord's day. And once they finished walking in the, walk, waking all the sinners, the monks themselves hurried back to bed. Although not everyone in the area was affected by the cathedral bells, the monks would have been furious to learn a young woman in the countryside managed to sleep through their obnoxious ringing. 14-year-old Bristol Evergreen awoke the same way she did every morning to the sound of banging on her bedroom door. Okay, really quick before we go any further, I want to tell you guys last night, right before I fell asleep, I was like, oh my God, what if Bristol is fairy godmother? Did anyone else have that thought? Me. He's lying. Oh, I usually, at least when I go to sleep at night, I have just random name. What a fairy godmother as a thought before I go to sleep. And last night happened to be Bristol. So I looked out. Or you all looked out. It could have been Shaniqua from two nights ago. So it just happened to be this. We're not gonna lie, I didn't see that coming as an answer. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're reading the same book. That's good. That was very funny. This is my last tier. There it goes. Too many of them. <sighs> okay. Well, anyway, that was the thought that I had. And that's not a spoiler because I really don't know. All right. 14-year-old Bristol Evergreen awoke the same way she did every morning to the sound of banging on her bedroom door. Bristol, are you awake, Bristol? Her blue eyes fluttered open somewhere between the seventh and eighth time her mother pounded on the door. Bristol wasn't a heavy sleeper, but mornings were a challenge because she was usually exhausted from staying up the night before. Bristol, answer me, child. Bristol sat up in bed as the cathedral bells played their final toll in the distance. She found an open copy of the Tales of Tidbit the Twitch by Tom Free Taylor lying on her stomach and a pair of glasses dangling from the tip of her nose. Once again, Bristol had fallen asleep reading and she was quickly and she quickly disposed of the evidence before she was caught. She stashed the book under her pillow and tossed her reading glasses into the pocket of her nightgown, then extinguished the candle on her nightstand that had been burning all night. Young lady, it's 10 past six, I'm coming in. Mrs. Evergreen pushed the door open and charged into her daughter's bedroom like a bull released from a pen. She was a thin woman with a pale face and dark circles under her eyes. Her hair was pulled into a tight bun on top of her head and the reins of a horse and like the reins of a horse, it kept her alert and motivated throughout her daily chores. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, it me. <laughs> so you are awake, she said with one eyebrow raised. Is it a simple acknowledge is a simple acknowledgement too much to ask for? Um, good morning, mother, Bristol said cheerfully. I hope you slept well. Not as well as you, apparently, Mrs. Evergreen said. Honestly, child, how do you sleep through those dreadful bells every morning? They're loud enough to wake the dead. Just lucky, I suppose, she said through a large yawn. Mrs. Evergreen laid a white dress at the foot of Bristol's bed and shot her daughter a scornful look. You left your uniform on the clothesline again, she said. How many times do I have to remind you to pick up after yourself? I can barely manage the laundry for your father and your brothers. I don't have time to clean up after you, too. Sorry, mother, Bristol apologized. I was going to get it after I finished the dishes last night, but I, I guess I forgot. 
You've got to stop being so careless. Daydreaming is the last quality that men look for in a wife, her mother warned. Now hurry up and get dressed so that you can help me with breakfast. It's a big day for your brother, so we're making his favorite. What a paragraph. Mrs. Evergreen headed for the door, but paused when she noticed a strange scent lingering in the air. Do I smell smoke? She asked. I just blew out a candle, Bristol explained. And why was your candle burning so early in the morning? Mrs. Evergreen said. I, I accidentally left it on during the night, she confessed. Mrs. Evergreen crossed her arms and glared at her daughter. Bristol, you better not be doing what I think you're doing she warned, because I worry what your father might do if he finds out you've been reading again. No, no, I promise, Bristol lied. I just like sleeping with a candle that sometimes I get scared in the dark. Unfortunately, Bristol was a terrible liar. Mrs. Evergreen saw through her daughter's dishonesty like a window that she had recently cleaned. The world is dark, Bristol, she said. You're a fool if you let anyone tell you otherwise. Now, hand it over. But mother, mother, please, I only have a few pages left. Bristol Evergreen, this is not up for discussion, Mrs. Evergreen said. You're breaking the rules of this house and the laws of this kingdom. Now hand it over immediately or I will fetch your father. Bristol sighed and surrendered her copy of the Tales of Tidbit the Twitch from under her pillow. And the others... Mrs. Evergreen asked with an open palm. That's the only one. I Young lady, I will not tolerate any more of your lies. Books in your bedroom are like mice in the garden. There's never just one. Now give me the others or I will fetch your father. Bristol's posture sank with her spirits. She stepped out of bed and led her mother to a loose floorboard in the corner of her bedroom where she kept a hidden collection. Mrs. Evergreen gasped when her daughter revealed over a dozen books in the floor. There were texts on history, religion, law, economics, as well as fictional titles of adventure, mystery, and romance. And judging by the distressed covers of the pages, Bristol had read every single book multiple times. Oh, Bristol, Mrs. Evergreen said with a heavy heart. Of all the things for a girl your age to be interested in, why did it have to be books? Mrs. Evergreen said the word like she was describing a foul and dangerous substance. Bristol knew that it was wrong to have, pay have books in her possession. The Southern Kingdom's laws clearly stated that books were for male eyes only. But since nothing made Bristol happier than reading, she repeatedly risked the consequences. One by one, Bristol kissed each book's spine like she was saying goodbye to a small pet and then passed it to her mother. The books piled over Mrs. Evergreen's head, but she was used to having her hands full and had no trouble finding her way to the door. I don't know who is supplying you with these, but you need to cut ties with them immediately, Mrs. Evergreen said. Do you know what the punishment is for girls who get caught reading in public? Three months in a workhouse, and that's with your father's connections. But Mother Bristol asked, why aren't women allowed to read in this kingdom? The law says our minds are too delicate to be educated, but that just isn't true. So what's the real reason they keep books from us? Mrs. Evergreen paused in the doorway and went silent. Bristol figured her mother was thinking about it because she rarely paused for anything. Mrs. Evergreen looked back at her daughter with a long face, and for a brief moment, Bristol could have sworn she saw a rare spark of sympathy in her mother's eyes, like she'd been asking herself the same questions all her life, but didn't have an answer. If you ask me, women have enough to do as it is, she said to bury the subject. Now get dressed. Breakfast isn't going to make itself. Mrs. Evergreen turned on her heel and left the room. Tears came to Bristol's eyes as she watched her mother depart with her books. To Bristol, they weren't just stacks of parchment bound by leather. The books were her friends. They offered her the only escape from suppression the Southern Kingdom offered. She dried the corners of her eyes with the edge of her nightgown, but her tears didn't last very long. Bristol knew it was only a matter of time before she would rebuild her collection. Her supplier was much closer to her than her mother realized. She stood in front of her mirror as she applied all the layers and accessories of her ridiculous school uniform. A white dress, white leggings, lacy white gloves, a fuzzy white shoulder wrap, and white buckle heels. To complete the transformation, Bristol tied a white ribbon in her brown hair. 
Bristol looked at her reflection and let out a prolonged sigh that came from the bottom of her soul. Like all the young women in the kingdom, Bristol was expected to resemble a living doll anytime she left her home, and Bristol hated dolls. In fact, anything that remotely influenced girls to want motherhood or marriage was instantly added to the list of things to resist. To resent, excuse me. And given the Southern Kingdom's stubborn views on women, Bristol had acquired a very long list over time. For as long as she could remember, Bristol had known she was destined for a life beyond the confines of her kingdom. Her accomplishments would surpass acquiring a husband and children. She was going to have adventures and experiences that extended beyond cooking and cleaning, and she was going to find an undeniable happiness like the characters in her books. Bristol couldn't explain why she felt this way or how it would happen, but she felt it with her whole heart. Until the day arrived that proved her right, Bristol had no choice but to play the role that society had assigned to her. In the meantime, Bristol found subtle and creative ways of coping. To make her school uniform bearable, Bristol put her reading glasses on the end of a gold chain, like a locket, and then tucked them into the top of her dress. It was doubtful that she would get to read anything worthwhile at school. Young women were only taught to read basic recipes and street signs, but knowing that she was prepared to read made Bristol feel like she was armed with a secret weapon. And knowing she was rebelling, however slightly, gave her an energetic boost that she needed to get through each day. Bristol, I meant breakfast today. Get down here. I'm coming, she replied. The Evergreen family lived in a spacious country home, just a few miles east of Chariot Hills Town Square. Bristol's father was a well-known justice in the Southern Kingdom's court system, which granted Evergre the Evergreen family more wealth and respect than most families had. Unfortunately, because their livelihood came from taxpayers, it was considered distasteful for the Evergreens to enjoy extravagances. And since the justice valued nothing more than his good reputation, his deprive, he deprived his family of extravagances whenever and wherever possible. All the Evergreens' belongings, from their clothes to their furniture, were hand-me-downs from friends and neighbors. None of the drapes had the same pattern. Their dishes and silverware came from different sets, and even the chairs had been made by a different carpenter. Each been made by a different carpenter. Even the wallpaper had been peeled off the walls of other houses in a chaotic mix of different designs. Their property was large enough to employ a staff of 20, but Justice Evergreen believed that servants and farmhands were the most extravagant of extravagances. And so Bristol and her mother were forced to complete all the yard work and house chores by themselves. Stir the porridge while I make the eggs, Mrs. Evergreen ordered Bristol when she finally arrived in the kitchen. But don't over stir this time, your father hates soggy oats. Bristol tied an apron over her school uniform and took a wooden spoon from her mother. She was at the stove for less than a minute when a panicked voice called to them from the next room. Mama, come! Quick, it's an emergency! What's the matter, Barry? One of my buttons popped off my robe! Oh, for the king's sake, Mrs. Evergreen muttered under her breath. Bristol, go help your brother with his button and make it fast. Bristol retrieved a sewing kit and hurried into the sitting room beside the kitchen. To her surprise, she found her 17-year-old brother seated on the floor. His eyes were closed and he rocked back and forth while clutching a stack of note cards. Barry Evergreen was a thin young man with messy brown hair and had been wide-eyed and nervous since the day he was born. But today, he was exceptionally nervous. Barry, Bristol addressed him softly. Mother sent me to fix your button. Can you take a break from studying or should I come back later? No, now is fine, Barry said. I can practice while you sew. He got to his feet and handed his sister the detached button. Like all the students at the Chariot Hills University of Law, Barry wore a long gray robe and a square black hat. Bristol threaded the needle and stitched the button back onto his collar while Barry glanced down at the prompt on his first note card. He fiddled with the other buttons of his uniform while he concentrated, and Bristol slapped his hand away before he caused more damage. Uh, the Purification Act of 342, the Purification Act of 342, Barry read to himself. That was when King Champion the Eighth charged the Troll Kingdom with vulgarity and banished their species from the Southern Kingdom. Satisfied with his answer, Barry flipped the first note card over and read the correct answer written on the back. Unfortunately, he was wrong, and he reacted with a long, defeated moan. Ugh. Bristol couldn't help but smile at her brother's frustration. He reminded her of a puppy chasing its own tail. This isn't funny, Bristol, Barry said. I'm going to fail my examination. 
Oh, Barry, calm down, she laughed. You're not going to fail. You've been studying the law your entire life. That's why it would be so humiliating. If I don't pass the examination today, then I won't graduate from the university. And if I don't graduate from the university, then I won't become a deputy justice. And if I don't become a deputy justice, then I won't become a justice like father. And if I don't become a justice, then I'll never be a high justice. Like all the men in the Evergreen family before him, Barry was studying to become a justice in the Southern Kingdom's court system. He had attended the Chariot Hills University of Law since he was six years old. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, he would take a grueling examination that would determine whether he would become a deputy justice. If he was accepted, Barry would spend the next decade prosecuting and defending criminals on trial. Once his time as deputy justice was over, Barry would become an official justice and preside over trials like his father. And should his career as a justice please king, the king, Barry would be the first evergreen to become high justice on the king's advisory council, where he would help the sovereign create the laws. Becoming a high justice had been Barry's dream since he was a child. His path to the king's advisory council would end today if he did not pass this examination. So... For the last six months, Barry had studied his kingdom's laws and history at every possible moment he could to ensure victory. How will I ever look father in the eye again if I don't pass? Barry worried. I should just give up now and I should spare myself the embarrassment. Stop catastrophizing, Bristol said. You know all this stuff. You're just letting your nerves get to you. I'm not nervous. I'm a ruck. I was up all night making these cards and I can barely read my own handwriting. Whatever the Purification Act of 342 was, it's definitely not what I said. Your answer was really close, Bristol said, but you're thinking of the Declawing Act of 339 and that was when Champion the Eighth banished the trolls from the Southern Kingdom. Unfortunately, his army mistook the elves for trolls and kicked out the wrong species. So to validate the mix up, Champion the Eighth introduced the Purification Act of 342 and banished all talking creatures besides humans from the kingdoms. The trolls, the elves, the goblins, the ogres were all rounded up and forced into the in-between. So it inspired the other kingdoms to do the same thing. And that led to the, led to the great cleansing of 345. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? And to think the most violent period in history could have been avoided if Champion the Eighth had just apologized to the elves. Bristol could tell her brother was half thankful for the reminder and half embarrassed that it came from his little sister. Oh yeah, right, Barry said. Thanks, Bristol. My pleasure, she said. It's a real shame too. Can you imagine how exciting it would be to see one of those creatures in person? Her brother did a double take. Wait, how did you know all of this? Bristol glanced over her shoulder to make sure that they were still alone. It was in one of the history books you gave me, she whispered. It was such a fascinating read and I must have read it four or five times. Do you want me to stay and help you study? I wish you could, Barry said. Mother will be suspicious if you don't return to the kitchen, and she'll be furious if she catches you helping me. Bristol's eyes twinkled as a mischievous idea popped into her head. In one swift move, she yanked all the buttons off of Barry's robe. Before he could react, Mrs. Evergreen charged into the room as if she sensed her daughter's mischief in the air. How long does it take to sew one button? She reprimanded. I've got the porridge in the pot, the eggs in the pan, the rolls in the oven. Bristol shrugged innocently and showed her mother a handful of buttons that she had plucked. Sorry, mother, she said. It's worse than we thought. He's really nervous. Mrs. Evergreen threw her hands in the air and moaned the ceiling. Barry Evergreen, this house is not your personal tailor shop, she scolded. Keep your twitchy hands off your robe or I'll tie your hands behind your back like when you were a child. Bristol, when you finished, go set the table in the dining room. We eat in 10 minutes, buttons or not. Mrs. Evergreen stomped back to the kitchen, murmuring slurs under her breath. Bristol and Barry covered each other's mouths as they, as they laughed in their mother's dramatics. It was the first time Bristol had seen her brother smile in weeks. I can't believe you did that, he said. Your examination is more important than breakfast, Bristol said, and began sewing the rest of the buttons on. And you don't need your cards. I've practically memorized all the old school books that you've given me. Now, I will name a historical act and you tell me the history behind it, all right? All right, he agreed. Good, let's start with the Border Act of 274. Okay, Border Act of 274, uh, Border Act of 274. Barry thought out, oh, I know. That was the decree that established the protective pass through the in-between so that the kingdoms could participate in safe trade. 
Bristol winced at his answer. Mm, almost, but no, she said gently. Protective paths were established with the Protective Paths Act of 296. Barry groaned and pulled away from Bristol while she was in the middle of sewing. He paced around the sitting room and rubbed his face with his head. This is pointless, he grumbled. I don't know any of this. There have to be so many numbers in history. Why do there have to be so many numbers in history? Oh, that's a really interesting story, actually, Bristol happily informed him. The Southern Kingdom developed a calendar system when the very first king champion was crowned. It was so efficient that the other kingdoms began using the same... I'm, I'm sorry, Barry. That was a rhetorical question, wasn't it? Her brother dropped his arms and was staring at her in disbelief. He had meant it as a rhetorical question, but after hearing his sister's explanation, he realized he was wrong about the invention of the calendar, too. I give up. Barry declared. I'm going to quit the university and become a shopkeeper. I'm going to sell rocks and sticks to small children. <laughs> that guy am using my Chucky voice. You recognized? <laughs> it's true. That is my Chucky voice for Rugrats. But it's funny, right? It works. We have to have a different voice for her brother than for her. It can't just be some, it can't be like Connor's voice. That would be too, we have to have a different boy voice. This is my other boy voice. I give up, Barry declared. I'm going to quit the university and become a shopkeeper. And I'm going to sell rocks and sticks to small children. I won't make much money, but at least I'll never run out of materials. Bristol was losing patience with her brother's attitude and she grabbed his chin and held him still so that he could, so that she could look him in the eye. Barry! You need to snap out of it, she said. All your answers are coming from the right place, but you keep putting the cart before the horse. Remember, the law is history, and history is just another story. All of these events have a prequel and a sequel, cause and effect. Before you answer, put all the facts you know on an imaginary timeline. Find the contradictions, focus on what's missing, and then fill in the blanks the best you can. Barry went quiet as he thought about his sister's advice. Slowly but surely, a seed of positivity that she had planted in him began to grow. Barry gave Bristol a determined nod and took a deep breath like he was about to dive off a high cliff. You're right, he said. I just need to relax and focus. Bristol released Barry's chin so that she could continue repairing his wardrobe while she also repaired his self-confidence. Now, the Border Act of 274, she said. Give it another try. Barry concentrated and didn't make a sound until he was certain he had the right answer. After the Four Corners World War of 250, all four kingdoms agreed to stop fighting over land and their leaders signed the Border Act of 274. The treaty finalized the borders of each kingdom and established the in-between zones between nations. Very good, Bristol cheered. What about the In-Between Neutralization Act of 283? Barry thought very carefully when his eyes lit up and as the answer came to him. The in-between neutralization of 283 was an internal agreement to neutralize the in-between zone so none of the kingdoms could claim it as their territory. And as a result, the in-between was left with no authority and became a very dangerous place, which led to the Protective Paths Act of 290. Ouch! Bristol was so proud of her brother, she accidentally poked him with her sewing needle. That's correct. She said, see, you have all the information you need to pass the examination. You just have to believe in yourself as much as I believe in you. Barry blushed a color and color finally returned to his face. Thank you, Bristol, he said. I'd be lost in my own head if it weren't for you. It's really a shame you're, you know, oh, a girl. You would have made an incredible justice. Bristol lowered her head and pretended she was still sewing the final button so he didn't see the sadness in her eyes. Oh? She said, I never really thought about it. On the contrary, that was something that Bristol wanted more than her brother could ever have imagined. Being a justice would allow her to redeem and elevate people. It would provide a platform to spread hope and understanding. It would give her the resources to make the world a better place for girls like her. But sadly, it was unlikely a woman would have any role in life but wife and mother in the Southern Kingdom. So Bristol extinguished her ideas before they turned into hopes. Maybe when you're a high justice, you could convince the king to let women read, she told her brother. That would be a great start. Yeah, maybe, Barry said with a weak spell. For now, at least you have my old books to keep you entertained. That reminds me, did you finish the Tales of Tim and the Twitch yet? I'm dying to talk to you about the ending, but I don't want to give anything away. I only had seven pages left, but mom caught me this morning and confiscated all my books. Could you please stop by the library and see if there are any old books that you're getting, they're getting rid of? I already thought of a new hiding spot to keep them in. Yeah, certainly, but the examination will last until late this afternoon. I'll stop by the library tomorrow and Barry's voice trailed off before he finished the actual thought. 
Actually, I suppose it'll be more difficult than it used to be. The library is next to the university, but if I get accepted into the justice deputy program, I'll be working at the courthouse. It may be a week or two before I can seek away again. Until this moment, Bristol had never realized how much her brother's pending graduation was going to affect her. Barry would no doubt pass examination with flying colors and be put to work as deputy justice right away. For years to come, all his time and energy would be spent prosecuting and defending criminals at the courthouse. Spying his little, supplying his little sister with books would be his last priority. That's all right, Bristol said through a forced smile. I'll, I'll find something to do in the meantime. Well, all your, all your buttons are reattached. I better go set the table before mother gets upset. Bristol hurried into the dining room before her brother noticed the anguish in her voice. When he said weeks, she knew it might be months or even a year before she had another book in her hands. So much time without distraction from her mundane life would be torturous. If she wanted to keep her sanity, she would have to find something to read outside their home. And given the kingdom's harsh punishment for female readers, Bristol would have to be clever, very clever, if she didn't want to get caught. Breakfast is ready, Mrs. Evergreen announced. Come and eat, your father's carriage will be here in 15 minutes. Bristol quickly set the dining room table before her family members arrived. Barry brought his note cards to the table and flipped through them while he waited for the meal to begin. Bristol couldn't tell if it was his freshly sewn buttons or his restored confidence, but Barry was sitting much taller than when she found him on the floor. She took great pride in the physical and mental alterations she had provided him. Their older brother, Brooks, was the first to join Bristol and Barry at the dining room table. He was tall and muscular and had perfectly straight hair and always looked like he had somewhere better to be, especially when he was with his family. Brooks had graduated from the university and gone to the deputy justice program just two years earlier. And like all other deputies, he wore gray and black checkered robes and a slightly taller black hat than Barry's. Instead of greeting his siblings, Brooks grunted and rolled his eyes when he saw Barry flipping through his note card. Are you still studying? He sneered. Is there something wrong with studying? Barry shot back. Only the way you do it, Brooks ridiculed him. Really, brother, if it takes you this long for that information to sink in, perhaps you should pursue another profession. I hear Fort Worths are in the market for a new stable boy. Brooks took a seat across from his brother and put his feet on the table inches away from Barry's note cards. How interesting. I heard the Fort Worths are also in the market for a new son-in-law since their daughter declined your proposal, Barry replied. Twice, as the rumor goes. Bristol couldn't stop laugh from, from surfacing. Brooks mocked his sister's laughter with a cruel imitation and then squinted at Barry when, when he plot, as he plotted his next insult. In all honesty, I do hope that you pass your examination today, he said. You do? Bristol asked with suspicious eyes. Huh, that's out of character. Yeah, I do, Brooks snapped. I look forward to going head to head with Barry in the courtroom. I'm bored with humiliating him at home. Brooks and Barry glared at each other with the complicit hatred only brothers could have for one another. Fortunately, their exchange was interrupted before it became more heated. Justice Evergreen entered the dining room with a stack of parchment under his arm and a quill between his fingers. He was an imposing man with a thick white beard, and after a long career of judging others, several deep lines had formed across his forehead. Like all the justices in the Southern Kingdom, Justice Evergreen wore a black robe that flowed from his shoulders to his toes and a tall black hat that forced him to duck through doorways. His eyes were the exact shade of blue as his daughter's and they even shared the same astigmatism, which was greatly beneficial to Bristol. Unbeknownst to her father, whenever the justice discarded an old pair of reading glasses, his daughter got a new pair. Upon his arrival, the evergreen children rose and respectfully stood by their chairs. It was custom to rise for a justice when attending the courthouse, but Justice Evergreen expected it from his family at all times. Good morning, father, the evergreens said together. You may be seated, Justice Evergreen permitted, without looking any of his children in the eye. He took his seat at the head of the table and immediately buried his nose in paperwork as if nothing else in the world existed. Mrs. Evergreen appeared with a pot of porridge and a large bowl of scrambled eggs and a hot tray of rolls. Bristol helped her mother serve breakfast, and once all the men's plates were filled, filled the women filled their own and sat down. What is this rubbish? Brooks asked and poked at the food with a fork. Eggs and oats, Mrs. Evergreen said. It's Barry's favorite. Brooks moaned as if he found the meal offensive. <laughs> I should have known, he scoffed. Barry has the same taste as a sow. Sorry if it isn't your favorite, Brooks. Barry said, perhaps mother can make cream of kitten and infant tears for you tomorrow. Bristol, uh, sorry. 
Dear Lord, these boys will be the death of me, Mrs. Evergreen said and looked at the ceiling in distress. Would it kill either of you to take a day off from this nonsense, especially on a morning as important as this? Once Barry passes him examination, the two of you are going to be working together for a very long time and it would do you some good to learn how to be civil. In many ways, Bristol was thankful that she didn't have the opportunity to become a justice because it spared her from the nightmare of working with Brooks at the courthouse. He was very popular amongst the other deputy justices and Bristol worried how Brooks would use his connections to sabotage Barry. Ever since his younger brother was born, Brooks had seen Barry as a threat of some kind, as if only one evergreen son was allowed to succeed. I apologize, mother, Brooks said with a phony smile. And you're right. I should be helping Barry get ready for his examination. Let me share some of the questions that nearly stumped me during my examination. Questions that I guarantee he won't see coming. Coming? Coming. For example, what's the difference between the punishment for trespassing on private property and the punishment for trespassing on royal property? Barry beamed with confidence. Clearly, he was much more prepared for his examination than Brooks had been for his own. The punishment for trespassing on private property is three years in prison, and the punishment for trespassing on royal property is 50, Barry said, and serving justices decide whether or not hard labor should also be added. <laughs> I'm afraid that's wrong, Brooks said. It's five years for private property and 60 years for royal property. For a moment, Bristol thought she had misheard Brooks. She knew for a fact that Barry's answer was correct. She could even visualize the exact page of the law book where she had read it. Barry looked just as confused as his sister. He turned to Justice Evergreen, hoping that his father would correct his brother's claim, but the justice never glanced up from his paperwork. I'll give you another one, Brooks said. In what year was the death penalty changed from drawing and quartering to beheading? Good heavens, Brooks. Some of us are eating, Mrs. Evergreen scolded. That was, um, that was... Barry trembled as he tried to recall. That was the year 567. Wrong again, Brooks sang. The first public beheading wasn't until 568. Oh dear, you're not very good at this game. Barry started second guessing himself and his confidence faded with his posture. Bristol cleared her throat to get Barry's attention, hoping to expose Brooks's charade with a telling look, but, Brooks, but Barry didn't hear her. Let's try something simple, Brooks said. Can you name the four pieces of evidence a prosecutor needs to charge a suspect with murder? That's easy, Barry replied. A body, a motive, a witness, a, and, and Brooks was watching, enjoy, watching and enjoying his brother's struggles. You're already way off. Let's try another one, he said. How many justices does it take to appeal the ruling of another justice? What are you talking about, Barry asked. Justices can't appeal. Wrong again, Brooks said screeching like a crow. I can't believe how underprepared you are, especially given the amount of time you've been studying. If I were you, I would have prayed that the examiner is out sick. All the color drained from Barry's eyes and his eye, his, from his face and his eyes drew large and he gripped the note card so firmly that they started to bend. He looked hopeless and scared as when Bristol found him in the sitting room. Every brick of self-esteem that she had laid was now being demolished for Brooks' amusement. She couldn't take another moment of his cruel game. Don't listen to him, Barry, she shouted, and the room went silent. Brooks is asking you trick questions on purpose. First, the punishment for trespassing on private property is three years in prison, and the punishment for trespassing on royal property is 50. It's only five and 60 if the property is damaged. Second, the first public beheading was in 568, but the law changed to five in 567, like you said. Third, there aren't four elements needed to charge a suspect with murder. There are only three, and you named them all. And fourth, justices can't appeal the ruling of another justice. Only a high justice can overturn a Bristol Lynn Evergreen. For the first time all morning, Justice Evergreen found a reason to look up from his paperwork. His face turned bright red, veins bulging out of his neck, and he roared so loudly all the dishes on the table rattled. How dare you reprimand your brother? Who do you think you are? It took Bristol a few seconds to find her voice. But, 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 but father, Brooks isn't t telling the truth. She stuttered. I, 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 I just, I just don't want B -B -B Barry to fail his. I don't care if Brooks said the sky is purple. It's not a young woman's place to correct a man. And if Barry isn't smart enough to keep, to know that he's being fooled, then he has no business being a deputy justice. Tears came to Bristol's eyes and she trembled in her seat. 
She looked to her brothers for support, but they were just as frightened as she was. I'm, I'm sorry, father. You have no right knowing any of the information that you just recited. If I found out that you've been reading again, so help me God, I will throw you out onto the street. Bristol turned to look at her mother, praying that she wouldn't mention the books she'd found in her bedroom earlier. Just like her sons, Mrs. Evergreen stayed silent and still like a mouse in the presence of a hawk. No, 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 I, I haven't been reading. Then where did you learn all of that? I, I did, I did, I just picked it up from Barry and Brooks. They're always talking about the laws and the courthouse at the table. Then perhaps you should eat outside until you learn to tune it out. No daughter of mine is going to defy the laws of this kingdom by being precocious. The justice continued to shout his disappointment and disgust for his daughter. Bristol wasn't a stranger to her father's temper. In fact, she rarely communicated with him unless he was screaming at her, but nothing was worse than being on the receiving end of his fury. With every heartbeat, Bristol sank a little more into her chair, and she counted down the seconds until it was over. Usually, if he didn't stop yelling by the count of 50, her father's wrath would escalate into something physical. Well, is that the carriage I hear? Mrs. Evergreen asked. The family went silent as they tried to hear what Mrs. Evergreen heard, and a few moments later, the sound of bells and galloping filled the house as the carriage approached outside. Bristol wondered if her mother had actually heard it or if the interruption was just lucky timing. The three of you better get going before it's too late. Justice Evergreen and his sons gathered their things and met the carriage outside. Barry took his time as, the, as he shut the front door behind him so that he could wave goodbye to his sister. Thank you, he mouthed to her. Good luck today, she mouthed back. Bristol stayed in her seat until she was certain her father and her brothers were a good distance down the road. By the time she regained her senses, Mrs. Evergreen had already cleared the dining room table and Bristol went to the kitchen to see if her mother needed help with the dishes, but her mother wasn't cleaning. Instead, Bristol found Mrs. Evergreen leaning on the sink, staring down at the dirty dishes with a heavy gaze as if she were in a trance. Thank you for not mentioning the books to father, Bristol said. You shouldn't have corrected your brother like that. Mrs. Evergreen said quietly, I know, Bristol said, I mean it, Bristol, her mother said and turned to her daughter with wide, fearful eyes. Brooks is very well liked in town. You do not want to make him your enemy. If he starts saying bad things about you to his friends, mother, I don't care what Brooks says about me. Well, you should, Mrs. Evergreen said sternly. In two years, you'll be 16 and men will start courting you for marriage. You cannot risk your reputation that scars you for all good, that will scare all the good ones away. You don't want to spend the rest of your life with someone mean and ungrateful. Trust me. Her mother's remarks left Bristol speechless. She couldn't tell if she was just imagining it, but the dark circles under her mother's eyes seemed a shade darker than they were before breakfast. Now go to school, Mrs. Evergreen said. I'll take care of the dishes. Bristol was compelled to stay and argue with her mother. She wanted to list all the reasons why her life should be different than other girls. She wanted to explain why she was destined for greater things than marriage and motherhood, but when she remembered she had no evidence to support her beliefs, perhaps her mother was right. Maybe Bristol was a fool for thinking the world was anything but dark. With nothing more to say, Bristol left her home and headed for school. As she walked along the path into town, she imagined her mother leaning at the sink, staying prominently in her mind. Bristol worried that it was much of a glimpse into her future as it was a memory of her mother. No, she whispered to herself, that's not going to be my life. That's not going to be my life. That is not going to be my life. Bristol repeated the statement as she walked, hoping if she said it enough times, it might extinguish her fears. It may seem impossible right now, but I know something is going to happen. Something is going to change. Something is going to make my life different. Bristol was right to be worried. Escaping the confines of the Southern Kingdom was impossible for a girl her age. But in a few short weeks, Bristol's definition of impossible was going to change forever. Wowzer. Harsh times for Bristol. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think the mom's just doing the best she can. You know what I mean? She's just doing her level best to, to do what she can for her kids. Um, you know, you do what you can. That was wild. I mean, truly, Becca, truly, like literally though. Um, Wowzer, what a story. 
as always, Chris is just, you know. Um, I hope you like the voices that I gave the brothers and the dad and mom today. We will uh, move on to, I don't know what Gaston is. Watch me, I'm sorry about that. I don't know that book, I apologize. Um, anyway, right, truly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good, it's a good one, yeah. So we will have more tomorrow, of course. Exactly, Jen, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. Um, I know, it's true, I know, I know, I agree with everything all of you are saying, it's all true, it's all true. Um, oops, <laughs> sorry, Becca. I mean, you could have listened to it on your way, right? You can always take me with you. Um, all right, I'm gonna go and start getting stuff done. Just so you guys know, I've already started packing pre-orders and some of them are going out today. Um, so I will, yeah, don't do it now. You said it's too fun to be able to, to like all react together. That's, that's part of the fun of book club is getting the moments together. Cause we're all like, ah! you know, at the same time, that's why I never read ahead. Um, anyway, a lot of pre-orders are going out today. I have, a, um, some already packed. I'm going to pack more and then take them. I have an appointment this afternoon and I'm going to take them to post office on the way. Um, because I have an appointment this afternoon, I do not think there will be a, slime live this evening so just just be aware i don't think there will be one tonight um because it will take up too much time but i will see you guys later and i hope you have a great rest of your day um exactly that's right that that, that makes sense to me now you said i wouldn't either all right see you later guys